coming out again. Um, so I've really rushed through uh, a lot of geostatistics. And um, what I'm going to do now is uh, say, try to find uh, the few places in uh, say, the data fusion practice where we actually need to think in terms of geostatistics. I'll try to illustrate more the, the concepts we've seen earlier with, um, with what we are we're dealing with uh, the Topaz system mainly which is the, the system that we have uh, been primarily been using for the past uh, 20 years almost. So um, for this presentation, I brought graphics from uh, Pavel Sarkov, Francois Cunillon, Ji Pingxie, Ewan Simon. And um, so there's uh, things that you will find in publications in the end and some things that you uh, yeah, will just uh, uh, find in, in a presentation like this because it's, uh, it's not formal enough to be uh, published. Um, <clears throat> I would say a few generalities about our Tova system, how we generate the ensemble, um, about the diagnostics that we used uh, for, uh, say, uh, um, say fine-tuning our system. So it's called the DFS SRF. I'll come back to that. I'll uh, illustrate what the spatial covariances look like. And um, in that, I will also uh, give a few uh, thoughts about the, uh, the conservation issues and um, uh, the question that was uh, asked to Gaia yesterday about uh, how we maintain the balance in our analysis. And then if we have time, uh, a few uh, examples of uh, anamorphosis. Um, uh, the slides, yeah, I should, uh, should mention that, that's right. Um, in the, um, um, the, the reg registration page, the uh, events.nurse.no, um, you will find uh, two SharePoint links that uh, point to these, uh, these slides. They are open until 14th of June, I think. That's uh, the deadline uh, imposed by SharePoint. If the, the links don't work, uh, let me know. I'll try to, uh, yeah. I'll try to fix that. Yeah. I've only been using uh, OneDrive for the past uh, two years. I'm not yet an expert of that. So uh, let's start with a few generalities uh, about Topaz. Um, so uh, Topaz has been built around the, the HICOM ocean model, which is a three-dimensional uh, ocean model. It has, uh, say, uh, in our uh, configuration that we use in, uh, in, uh, in forecasting, uh, 11 to 16 resolution, uh, kilometer resolution horizontally. That makes uh, 800 times 880 uh, horizontal grid cells. Um, there's a CIS model in there. Um, I will come back to that. And the vertical coordinate is a bit particular because it's a hybrid coordinate. So you will find that uh, the water is discretized in the vertical on uh, you see this section to the right. Actually, it's a section that was uh, done by Geyer more than 20 years ago. Uh, the top uh, levels are, say, uh, um, spaced um, normally, I would say, from, uh, say, uh, by given distances. And then um, from a given depth, which is uh, the depth of the, the mixed layer, the model uses a uh, variable type of uh, layers that uh, depending on, on the density. So these layers can move up and down and they, uh, they, they are not defined by their size, but uh, by, the, by the, the water properties inside. So uh, that, they, um, that means that uh, we have uh, a state space of uh, uh, the classical uh, ocean variables. So the U and V, that's the velocity of the currents temperatures T, salinity S, and something called DP in HICOM, which is the layer thickness. And that's what uh, with um, our state vector in the ocean model, that's all the, the variables you need to start the ocean. Uh, the model uh, has many other variables, but they are uh, all diagnostic variables. You will need only these ones in the Z vector to uh, actually give us input to the, the model and it will run from there. So if you uh, now sum up over all of these, uh, say 28 uh, variables in uh, 3D plus six variable 2D and 28 layers uh, plus, and then multiply by 800 times 180 uh, horizontal grid points, you obtain uh, hundreds of uh, million unknowns. So that's, uh, that's large numbers, too, too large to use, uh, say uh, any uh, classical command filter or anything that would need, uh, say uh, a covariance matrix of that size times itself. So uh, examples of the, uh, the field, you have here an example of a uh, sea surface temperature in the Arctic, uh, sea surface salinity, 
um, the same date, uh, surface currents, the sea ice concentration, sea ice thickness. That's the uh, say um, a few of these uh, these variables that I've shown earlier. And uh, so they, uh, if you modify one, of course, you will need to modify the others because the there's only sea ice where the, the ocean is uh, below freezing point temperature. And uh, the, the change of salinity will also change at which temperature the, uh, the ocean will freeze. And uh, if the currents are moving the ice in one direction or the other, then uh, as well, that's, uh, uh, that means that if you change the currents, you need to change the sea ice as well. So they're all completely interconnected, these variables. And that's why uh, we've been very early uh, setting up the, uh, the ensemble kernel filter to try to do data simulation in a way that we don't need to worry about uh, the covariances. The covariances are set up by the, the model in some way. So um, <clears throat> when we set up the model, there is the question of the initial errors. You need to uh, feed the ensemble kernel filter with something that is representing your best shot at the uncertainty at the initial time. So um, you can run the model without data simulation. That's something that uh, we do anyway. We need to spin up the model. So to do that, we need to run the model uh, in a free, a free running mode without data simulation. And um, that means the model can give you one answer at any given time point. It will have all of the variables, temperatures and entities at all depths, all the currents. Um, how good it is, it will not tell. Uh, so we need to, uh, by trial and errors, find out uh, well uh, how large are the, uh, the differences between this model simulation and reality, and how uh, we can obtain different members of the uh, the same um, on the same date. So um, we've been uh, initially playing with this layer thickness variable, so we could uh, move the the water masses further up or down. And that, uh, that has some, uh, some, um, some advantages. It was very simple to do. Uh, you could use, uh, say, uh, good old uh, unconditional simulation of, uh, routines to do that. Uh, but then uh, that was not enough in a way that uh, uh, because the model accumulates uh, errors when it spins up, it drifts away from reality. And um, if, you're not taking to, if you're not thinking of these uh, drifting errors, then you, uh, you obtain errors that are too large to be corrected. You want the model ensemble to encompass reality. So uh, a better way to do that is um, to incorporate, um, say, the, what we call interannual variability. So that the change from year to year in the different uh, simulations as uh, the estimates of the errors at the initial time. So we run a long free run. We take the restart times at the same season, but in different years, and time warp them. So uh, put them uh, at the, the time when we initialize our ensemble and change the, the, the timestamp on the, the fields. So um, this gives an initial um, uh, ensemble. Then uh, we have model errors, and we um, we are oceanographers who, uh, as often in oceanographers, they tend to blame uh, things that go wrong on other fields, like the meteorologists, they can take the blame. So we could say, well, the, the model, the ocean model is actually wrong because of the meteorologist. It's the errors that comes from the forcing from above. So the heat fluxes, the winds, the precipitations, these things are wrong. And we'd like to, um, to assume that the, 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 these errors have given statistics <clears throat> and we are going to give you the statistics based again on our best shot. So we have set uh, the horizontal correlation of the, uh, the arrows, 200 kilometers. That was based as well on some, uh, say, uh, correlation uh, analysis. A time correlation of three days. Uh, that was more based on the, say, intuition that, uh, say, weather is passing and uh, Three days is maybe uh, as long as uh, the weather forecast can be trusted uh, in the ocean. And then the amplitudes. So how large is the error in uh, air temperature above the ocean? How large are the errors in uh, radiative fluxes, in precipitation? And don't always have uh, documented errors for all of that in the, uh, the what you obtain from the literature. So sometimes you have to dream up uh, the values so that they make sense and that they uh, they they are not too far off from, from reality. Um, 
in terms of the winds, uh, what we've done as well is to um, perturb the winds in a way that um, they are um, non-divergent. So uh, that's an option that we've put in, uh, in a code uh, a while ago. If we perturb the, uh, add perturbations of the winds that are in geostrophic balance, then uh, we won't increase the, the divergence or the convergence in the original fields that we want to perturb. Uh, this turned out that the, there's someone who um, used our code for the Adriatic Sea in a coastal model, and they preferred to uh, have uh, divergent and convergent uh, perturbations. They, that worked better for them. So I don't, I cannot claim that this is, uh, say, something that uh, is better in all circumstances. And then uh, there's some parameters of the model. So uh, uh, some numbers in the in the model that are, that are say, uh, internal parameters that we we can randomize. So we give different uh, different values for different members of the ensemble. Okay. Um, now, <coughs> sorry again, I've picked up um, 10 members uh, of an ensemble uh, from Topaz, and we can look at the ice thickness of the 10 members. So uh, these are all 10, uh, now uh, they are unconditional simulations. They are taken from uh, an ensemble run without a simulation and um, with the perturbations that we've seen earlier. Uh, actually, that's not true. They are conditional in the way that there has been some uh, cycles of data simulation in this example here. But I'm just showing you what an ensemble can look like before data simulation uh, in, uh, say, random in steady state. So uh, I don't know if you see what I see, but there's uh, some changes in the colors. It's jumping a bit back and forth. It's not a time animation. It is an ensemble animation. So every member is um, is uh, is coming one after the other, ten of them, and uh, well, there are some changes in the thickness, not very big, because the main feature, so where the ice is thick and where it is thin, remain the same every time, and that's what we want in an ensemble data simulation routine that is operational. That's the there's no violent differences between the members. You don't want this uh, animation to jump uh, violently from one member to the other because that will take you. Um, far out of the, uh, say, the Gaussian linear assumptions. That's all what is say, the, the core assumption of the ensemble common filter. Now, uh, same ensemble, different variables. We're looking now at the sea ice drift, so the movements of the sea ice. Of course, the ice is moving. And you see that, yes, the velocities are changing from one member to the other. This, uh, they're not drifting exactly in the same direction. But uh, it's always the same places that drift fast and also the same places that drift slowly. So. Um, these movements are not something that we impose by hand in the model. It is the result of the errors in the wind field, uh, in the wind uh, forcings. So you change slightly the winds, and what you obtain is slight changes in the drift of the sea ice that is following the wind. So um, still, even though you have put uh, some model errors, the ensemble current filter has a tendency to collapse, to reduce the ensemble spread. Uh, and that's because of the, uh, say, the inbreeding, the fact that you're using the covariance of the ensemble for two things. One, to um, estimate the, uh, the errors, and second, to correct the errors, because it is the input to the Kalman gain. So um, that uh, reduces, it tends to reduce the uncertainties too much, because the, uh, the ensemble has its uh, own self-trust that is too high. And uh, it's embarrassing, but we need some tricks. And one trick is the inflation. And the way we, um, we uh, practice this in Topaz is um, related to the, uh, the scheme we're using. We're using a, a square root scheme, the deterministic in KF by Sarkov and Wook 2008. And this is a scheme in which there is one equation for the mean of the ensemble and the second equation for the update of the anomalies. And since we know that the, uh, the reduction of the spread by the NKF is affecting the anomalies. They will be too small, but it doesn't affect the mean. Then what we can do is to uh, change slightly the equation uh, between the two steps. So if we use observation errors that are larger for the anomalies than for the mean, then we can maintain more ensemble spread, and it's a way of doing uh, inflation. It's apparently not the best way of doing inflation. 
Uh, you can see the review by Patrick uh, and uh, Alberto and co, uh, Mark Bocquet in 2019 for, say, uh, a more mathematical overview of what's been practiced and what's, uh, what's good. Um, but so far, yeah, we do have some inflation. Then uh, there's something we call also moderation of the observations, and that's an adaptive pre-screening of observations. The question is, uh, if you have an observation that is too far out of what the model pre predicts, are you going to assimilate it or are you going to reject it because it doesn't pass what we call the background check? It does not fit with the model. It's, uh, it may be dangerous to assimilate it. So in, uh, in our case, if the, uh, the PDF of the, um, the two PDFs of observations and model don't match, uh, we are uh, stretching the errors of the observations until there is a reasonable overlap with the ensemble spread. So that means that uh, you, know, you can still assimilate softly the observations that are far out of the, the model. And that's better than uh, trying to, uh, to assimilate uh, in a domain where neither the model or the observation has uh, any probability. And that being said, there's um, the setup of the observation errors. Um, we don't put any uh, correlation horizontally in the observation. Uh, so our covariance matrix is a diagonal matrix. That's for numerical convenience. It's um, uh, in a way it's a, it's, um, it's it's a practical thing to use this Woodbury uh, transformation you've seen yesterday, so that we can do the assimilation in ensemble space because we know that uh, our ensemble has a, a fixed size of a hundred, and most of the time that's the smallest matrix size we have when we consider number of observations, number of state variables and number of ensembles. So it's more economical to practice the assimilation in ensemble space. So that uh, is uh, say, justifying why we're using no diagonal uh, error covariance. Uh, we could include uh, non-diagonal terms by doing a bit more, say, uh, matrix algebra in the code. Uh, there's something called super observations. It's not observations that are super good. It's uh, just uh, when you have too many observations per grid cell of the, of the model, then we average them to also to uh, light, uh, have uh, less calculations. Uh, that being uh, done on observations, we don't assimilate all the observations at uh, every location. We do what we call the uh, local analysis. So after, uh, for example, uh, calculating a covariance, here is a covariance to the bottom right uh, between a sea surface anomaly, so a sea surface height observation, and the currents around that location. And uh, what you see uh, based on the, uh, say, an ensemble is that um, the radius of deformation, what we call uh, in oceanography, the Rossby radius, comes out. It is, uh, say, uh, how large is the uh, area of typical meanders and eddies in this area. And um, if you take an observation, uh, in what is uh, often called the loop current in the Gulf of Mexico, you can expect this observation to say something about the loop around it, the currents that rotate around this point, but not so much uh, further on uh, say, this uh, second eddy that is uh, located next to it. So we localize uh, the observation by searching only observation around uh, this radius around the, uh, the, the point of uh, the target point. Every observation that is further out is disregarded. Then there's some technicalities. We do uh, the, uh, the tapering so that the observations uh, that are just slightly outside and slightly inside uh, don't uh, come abruptly. So the, uh, the observations that are on the, uh, the rim of the uh, observation bubble are already uh, um, receive less waves. So um, yeah, that's all um, say uh, engineering, there's no science uh, involved in there, but it's things that we have to do to, uh, uh, to make the uh, assimilation go around. And it's the uh, local analysis is very important to make sure that the, uh, the assimilation is efficient. Uh, I once in my uh, beginnings did a global analysis with Topaz, so assimilating all observations everywhere with 100 numbers, and there was zero effect on the uh, assimilation. It was not, nothing was happening at all because with uh, 100 members and uh, half a million of observations, the, uh, the matrix inversion was completely overwhelmed. Yeah. There was not enough degrees of freedom to update. 
So um, now we come to this point that's a bit thorny about the conservation of properties. So uh, to look at that, it's important to uh, take go back to the paper by Gale in 2003, where he's taken the uh, say the update equation of the ensemble can filter, the Kalman gain, and uh, notice that the um, the x uh, anomalies xf matrix can be uh, factorized to the left of both the Kalman gain here and the uh, say the, the forecast. So it's possible to rewrite this matrix completely equivalent, no approximation, as a transform of the forecast. So if you take the forecast anomalies and you want to obtain the uh, ensemble anomalies of the analysis, it's sufficient to multiply by a T matrix to the right, a transform matrix. So in uh, the original paper, it was called X5, uh, but uh, it's, uh, it's more convenient to do, call it T, the transform matrix. And what you see on this expression here is that um, every, um, if, if you uh, remember that uh, you have been um, uh, putting together all of your um, state variables in uh, say a, ve a vector with all the layers and uh, all the temperatures and all the salinities. So this uh, temperature or salinity in the analysis in a given member will be a combination of the temperatures uh, of uh, the, um, at the same layer in the different members, just multiplied by a T matrix. That means um, that in the first order, uh, the T uh, transformation will uh, ensure the conservation of the linear properties. That is, if you have an equation that is linear between the, the variables of XF, multiplied by T will keep this equation just as linear in XA, in the analysis. So that's um, something we can uh, illustrate, for example, with the geostrophic balance. So I've shown you earlier that, uh, say, if you have a sea surface heights, then uh, uh, and, um, it's related to the currents around uh, a point where you have the sea surface heights. So for example, here you see an image of an eddy. You have currents rotating around the eddy. Inside the eddy, it's an anticyclonic eddy, um, you will have uh, lower densities. The waters are uh, lighter, so either they're warmer or they're fresher, but still uh, the density is lower inside the eddy than outside. This means that the, um, the sea surface will have a slightly higher elevation in the middle of the, of the eddy. Um, that means, and that's the, well, uh, the, the geostrophic balance, saying that the gradients of the sea surface heights is uh, equal to the, uh, the geostrophic currents, the currents rotating around the eddy. So if that is the case in the forecast member, you can apply any transformation matrix you want. This will still be the case in the analysis matrix. So this means that um, if you know that there's a linear balance in your model, you don't need to worry about it after the analysis. Unless, of course, if you have uh, taken the currents or the CCFS heights out of your state vector. Because then, of course, the, the analysis will update some variables of the ba linear balance, but not the others. And you will find yourself with an imbalance. But if you're clever enough to include all the uh, variables that are in balance within your state vector, then the linear balance will remain. What about the nonlinear properties? We have plenty of them in the ocean. Uh, you take this uh, say simple example of the density. Uh, the density of the ocean is a nonlinear function of temperature and salinity. That's uh, visible in this graphic here, especially at cold temperatures. You can take two points and uh, stretch a segment between them. The segment will not align with the ISO density lines. That means uh, that uh, if you are, say, um, combining in your ensemble different, uh, say, a member uh, has a value here at uh, 34.5 PSU, and another member has a value of 33.5 PSU, then uh, any linear combination that would come from this transformation matrix between the two or a bit outside would have a different density. So um, uh, how to deal with that? Uh, you could, for example, transform uh, your variables, say that you don't want to use salinity, you want to use spiciness. Uh, the oceanographers are very good at uh, having notions like spiciness, spiciness, is not salinity, but it's the orthogonal variable to temperature in this TS diagram. So if you uh, would transform salinity to spiciness, you will not need to worry about the density. Uh, we keep salinity as uh, say a state variable for different reasons, because uh, well, it's uh, 
It's also uh, the kind of variable that is additive. You can uh, mix and uh, have a, a salinity value. But um, you will notice that the, uh, say the difference of salinity between 33.5 and 34.5 here is very large to be what we have in a normal ensemble. So normally in an operational setting, you would not have ensembles with a, a delta density as large as this. And not, you would not have, say, in the same ensemble, members that are zero degrees and other members that are at nine degrees. It's, uh, it's very, um, it would be members that are very in very, very different conditions. Um, so that's not supposed to happen. And, uh, and if the, say, uh, the points are much more uh, tightly uh, packed together in the ensemble, then, uh, or in this example here above, then you're not too far from being in the linear uh, conditions and you don't need to worry about the, uh, these nonlinear properties. But there are some cases when you, you do need to worry. For example, here's an example of a uh, scalar plot between sea surface heights and temperatures in the Gulf of Mexico. And you will see that the temperature saturates. There's a maximum temperature of 27 degrees. And it, even in warm summer days, it hardly gets warmer than that. Uh, so um, having observations of sea surface uh, heights, the ensemble doesn't know about this maximum value. It will just see a straight line uh, among a cloud of points. And, um, and that means that uh, you may obtain values that are above uh, the maximum temperatures after the analysis. That may happen. Um, same thing, but a bit more tricky in salinity versus sea surface heights. Um, you can obtain, say, uh, a cloud of, uh, of points that looks very much well. It's not too far from being Gaussian. You have, uh, say, high and low values for different sea surface heights. And, um, and if you're a oceanographer, you notice that these salinity values are, say, uh, a given water type. And the values above here are different uh, ocean water types. And there's no, uh, in theory, there's no values between the two because these waters don't mix very much. But uh, the ensemble command filter doesn't know that. And if you have in the same ensemble uh, waters of the different water types, the ensemble assimilation may, for example, return sea surface heights between, uh, say, approximately 0 0.4. And that would yield salinities in the forbidden range where the, uh, these um, between the two water types. So that again, something that is very hard to prevent by, uh, say, uh, by brute force, and uh, you just uh, need to uh, to make sure that you uh, uh, the the ensemble uh, is uh, is tight enough around the the, the same um, uh, the same water masses that uh, these things don't happen too often. Yes. Um, now I have a little ex exercise for you. Um, you have ocean currents from space. Uh, yes, it's coming from altimeter. So the altimeters are measuring the sea surface heights. But as I told you earlier, you can calculate the gradients of sea surface heights and obtain something called the geostrophic currents, which are, say, approximately the surface currents. So if you're running an ocean model, uh, you can altimeter, uh, you can assimilate the altimeter field itself, sea surface heights, to the left or the gradients of these sea surface heights, the currents to the right. Uh, which, what would be your choice? Would you assimilate one, the other, or both together? Please answer in the chat. Left, right, or both? Let me think a bit. Gradients. Right, both, 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 a lot of both, yeah. Right, because no one wants to assimilate the sea surface heights. It's too bad because that's what we practice in Topaz. Well, okay, I've uh, tortured you enough. Uh, actually, I didn't give you really the keys to answer this, uh, this question here, but, um, the true answer is that uh, um, the uh, the gradients are say nothing different as a linear transformation of the sea surface heights. So as uh, information, they have the same content as the sea surface heights, and in uh, say linear data simulation method, um, it is the same uh, answer. So you can assimilate in principle the SSH field or the gradients, 
and you should obtain the same answer. Assimilating both, on the other hand, would actually assimilate the same information twice, so it will be like assimilating one of them with half the observation errors. So since as well, uh, so having vector observations, that's two fields instead of one, that's twice as many observations, we always assimilate the sea surface sites only, but we never assimilate the, uh, the uh, geosurface currents. And um, so, uh, yeah, but it's, um, it's a useful thing to uh, have in mind. Uh, in, in principle, the, uh, the assimilation is invariant by linear transformations. And in this case, the linear transformation is the gradient. Yeah, uh, the same thing in words. Um, and that works as well in variational data simulation because you minimize the cost function and whether you assimilate one or the other, uh, you would obtain the same minimum. So now I'm going to uh, diagnostics. The, um, the diagnostics we like to use is uh, something that tells us about the impact of the assimilation. Uh, did this observation uh, make it through the, uh, say, the assimilation? Was it assimilated harder or less uh, weaker than any other observation? That's things that you can quantify with, uh, say, a classical tool, the degrees of freedom for signal. So the DFS is um, the trace of KH, uh, Kalman gain times the observation matrix, observation operator. And uh, the advantage of this uh, trace of KH is that it's a linear function of the, uh, the, uh, the Kalman gain. And the Kalman gain uh, multiplied by the observation operator can be split linearly by all observations. So if you're assimilating several observations, as we do, we assimilate our temperatures, CFA side stuff, and uh, you can split this DFS and obtain, uh, say, a non-dimensional measure of the impact for each observation that was in there. Um, yeah, so there's, uh, there's a bit of an inconvenient as well for these degrees of freedom of signals is that it's not uh, very intuitive. It's hard to understand how big are the numbers. Uh, and on the other hand, if you take how much the spread is reduced, so this uh, uh, forecast spread uh, of the ensemble divided by the spread after the analysis, that uh, can give you a more intuitive measure of the strength of the assimilation, because uh, the forecast of the ensemble is supposed to bring some, some spread, some errors in the, uh, the process, and the assimilation is here to reduce the uncertainties. But all in all, they are supposed to go in a, say, in a wheel and a, in, a, in a steady state. So that what you uh, reduce by assimilation is uh, say increasing again with the, the, the next the following forecast. But uh, it should not deviate too much in one direction or the other. So you may have a better intuition of the SRF than of the DFS. I'm going to show that uh, later. So uh, an example here from one assimilation step of the, uh, the Thomas system. Here you have, uh, say, six different observation types and the total DFS to the left, total SRF to the right. So the DFS, the use of freedom for, for signal, if you uh, come back to the expression, trace of KH, uh, it, uh, it cannot be larger than the number of observations. Uh, that is, in our local analysis, is the number of observations assimilated within the radius of observations. And the other thing, it cannot be larger than uh, the ensemble size, which is, as I said earlier, the, uh, say the, the smaller of the, the numbers. So here, this DFS, uh, it's, uh, can, it's between 4, 6, 10 sometimes. At uh, a few given points, it's as high as 22, but it can be larger than 100. If the DFS is really reaching 100, so the, the ensemble size, that means that your ensemble has collapsed completely. There's no uh, degrees of freedom uh, left to, uh, to, to, uh, to start the, the next uh, assimilation. And um, in terms of DFS, of SRF, sorry, thread reduction, you will see that, uh, say, uh, at some places you reach one, as uh, SRF, which means that it's uh, say, counterintuitively, it's uh, shrunk the ensemble by a factor of two. So when you have 50% of the ensemble spread. And very exceptionally, yeah, there's a few points where you obtain two as a spread reduction. So that's uh, like 
uh, you, uh, you only have 33% of the spread you had before the assignation. Uh, here in this example, you see that it only happens in a few places. You see this spot here in the central Arctic, close to the North Pole. That's one, say, ice theta profiler. It's an uh, institute observation that was deployed during the International Polar Year. That's the year 2008 here. And that was a very, say, novel initiative to have uh, profiles in the Arctic below the ice. And this is a profile that came in an area where there's never been any observations taken before. So you can guess that the ensemble spread below the ice was pretty large. And having the very first measurement ever in this place was making a big splash. So that splash is uh, what you see here uh, with the, uh, the, uh, this uh, very high SRF values. So uh, as I told you earlier, we can split uh, the DFS or the SRF by observation type. So in our uh, assimilation, we assimilate sea level anomalies. Uh, the red here is what uh, the observations that are assimilated asynchronously. So they are taken at the time when the observation was taken. So the, uh, the, it has, there's an acronym in the literature call for that called FGAT, first guess at appropriate time. And uh, since, well, in, uh, in, K, in the case of the NKF, there's a, there's a proper framework uh, for that. We call it uh, asynchronous uh, assimilation. Still, uh, so there's sea level anomalies, sea surface temperatures, sea ice concentrations, sea ice drift, temperature salinity profiles. And uh, now we'll see the impact of each of these data types separately. So the first one is the sea level anomalies along the tracks. You see the tracks, there's the lines that are crossing the oceans. You see that the uh, assimilation um, is uh, has a, having an impact of 0 0.4, 0 0.8 in spread reduction factor, uh, exceptionally one in the Gulf Stream, for example, or close to the ice edge. But there's areas where it's very close to zero. One such area is the equator. You can guess that there's a line going from Brazil to Congo, and this line has almost no impact of the sea level anomalies. And that's because uh, of the physics. Uh, there's um, no Coriolis force near to the equator. And so by itself, uh, the covariances between sea surface sites and other variables are just vanishing uh, at the equator, and there's no impact of assimilating sea level anomalies at the equator. That's something that uh, the ensemble gives us as a present, um, by, and we don't need to do anything with it. Now, uh, the map of uh, the impact of sea surface temperatures is a bit more uh, uniform. There's areas where there's more impact than others. You see it's the more dynamical areas where you have the Gulf Stream and the, the return cur equatorial current, and uh, it's more quiet than uh, other places. And uh, sea, uh, sea ice concentrations are mostly active uh, along the ice edge. So there's uh, an air, a time in April where you, you can see quite clearly where the ice edge is located. And that's where uh, the sea ice concentration is active. Inside the ice edge, outside the ice edge, there's nothing happening. And now you have these uh, bubbles or uh, the, uh, a bit of uh, oil in the, in the soup. Uh, these eyes here are the, uh, the observation radius of the institute te temperature profiles. And that's mostly uh, Argo profiles and isolated profilers. And the same for the salinities. Um, yeah. So uh, that was the thing. I've skipped the computations because time is uh, running short. Um, the uh, covariances. So as we discussed with Michael earlier, um, in geostatistics, you have to uh, say uh, fit the variogram to have uh, proper covariances. Here, you have an ensemble that does the job for you. So, um, if you calculate the covariance between a surface temperature point and all the points around it, you will see that there's an area where the covariances are maximum above uh, 0 0.8, and uh, there's some uh, further spots of uh, say uh, high and low covariances which I believe are purely uh, noise. That's not something that uh, you would want to have in your assimilation because they, uh, they resemble the perturbations we put in the wind fields. Um, then if you take a line at a given uh, uh, latitude uh, and take the, the, a section of the, the model, you'll see again these uh, hybrid uh, coordinate layers in the vertical and the correlations uh, tend to diminish with the depth uh, and uh, you have two situations here, I've said, the, there's June to the left and December to the right. In June, uh, there's a shallow mixed layer, so the uh, surface temperatures are have an impact that is confined to the surface, that's where the, the covariance is highest. And in December, there's a deeper mixed layer and the, uh, 
there's more mixing and the uh, the covariance between the surface temperature uh, and the deep temperature is going deeper. It's also not strictly uh, symmetrical, it's slightly, slightly asymmetric, uh, asymmetrical because of the, the Gulf Stream coming nearby. So uh, then at least you don't need to worry about writing these covariances by hand. It's something that the model uh, can give you for the price of running an ensemble. Then um, the sea ice is tricky. As I told you earlier, it's only where the water is cold and uh, if, uh, it depends as well on salinity. So if you assimilate sea ice concentrations, you add ice or remove ice, uh, depending on the, the colors here along the ice edge. And you see that there's an impact on the temperatures where you have added ice, the water is colder. That's the, the, the ensemble is making sense of that because there's differences in the location of the ice edge between different ensemble members. And uh, more uh, interestingly, there's large differences in salinities, even far into the, uh, the, um, the ice edge. So um, there, uh, it's, uh, it's more tricky. You will not know exactly that adding ice will say, increase or decrease the, the, uh, the, uh, the salinity. It depends on the oceanography of the, of the area and the, and the season. So if you focus more on this area here, uh, that's the, uh, the, the Barents Sea, uh, the bottom is uh, uh, Svalbard, and here is Franz Josef Land, for those of you who are familiar with this, uh, say, Russian uh, islands. And um, the scatter plot between sea ice concentration here and sea surface salinities on the axis on the uh, y-axis is um, say uh, is showing a decreasing relationship, and it's of course saturates as zero. You not have negative uh, ice concentrations, and the uh, the ensemble kind of filter will just put a straight line. It does linear regression between these ensemble points. And uh, that will uh, change the, uh, the, uh, the salinities before and after assimilation. Um, and uh, the sign is different, different if you're looking inside the ice edge and outside of the ice edge, because that you're in the Barents Sea. And uh, in this area, there's warm, warm waters. The warm waters will bring uh, actually more saline waters because they're waters from the Atlantic, and this is more saline. But the warm waters will also melt the ice. So that explains why you have a ne negative relationship between surface salinity and sea ice concentration. If instead you're taking, say, uh, a static ensemble, so by uh, only collecting um, ensemble files from different years and uh, different seasons, then that will just uh, blur this uh, relationship. You will not see the difference between inside and outside the, the ice edge. So as a summary, uh, we've been running Tobas uh, for a long time. It's now the uh, Copernicus Marine Service for the Arctic. We use it for short-term forecast and reanalysis. So uh, that was said earlier, but, uh, the advantage of Monte Carlo method is that it's a naturally parallel operation. You can submit members in a supercomputer and uh, they will run uh, independently of each other. You can obtain 3D and multivariate covariances, and you can use a Gaussian anamorphosis. And that's the very last example I have here. So. You have the bloom of the prime production in the uh, in the ocean. It comes, uh, say, uh, in the spring every year. It happens at different places at different times, but still uh, the dynamic is uh, is very explosive. And if you consider the histogram of chlorophyll, it is uh, very typically what I've shown you earlier today. Uh, that's not Gaussian. It is, uh, say, uh, right skewed, and you have uh, a few very high values and a large mass of uh, zero values. Uh, same for nutrients, nitrates, maybe a bit less, uh, say, uh, um, uh, uh, less critical than for the, uh, the chlorophyll, but still uh, all of these uh, ecosystem variables have positive values. So uh, what can be done is this uh, construction of the Gaussian anamorphosis, where you can map the chlorophyll um, uh, cumulative distribution function to that of a standard Gaussian. You can uh, do that with uh, small steps of data and you uh, fit them with a uh, piecewise linear uh, bits. You have to take care of uh, extrapolating the last bit to infinity, uh, just in case there comes values that you've never seen before. Um, and that makes the, uh, the chlorophyll data more adequate for assimilation. Uh, most of the cases now we just uh, we saw the, for chlorophyll we mostly use a, a logarithm uh, as an amorphosis because that seemed to work well in all seasons, all times, all locations, and uh, so it was less complicated. Um, why is Gaussianity important? 
So uh, here is a scatter plot in uh, somewhere in the Gulf of Mexico between uh, observed chlorophyll observations and model chlorophyll observations. And if you just uh, use the scatter plot without the logs, then you find yourself with, a, say, uh, lots of values close to zero, uh, a bit of an L-shaped uh, scatter plot, and two values here that stick out of the ensemble. And um, if you um, if you're uh, doing linear regression uh, of these scatter plots, then know that that these big values here will drag the uh, the correlation and the, uh, the the regression quite a lot. But if you plot them uh, after an amorphosis, so in log scale, then this um, plot here looks more like uh, say um, a round uh, scatter plot. The uh, the good news is that this is more Gaussian, so it's more adequate for calculating regression, etc. The bad news is that, well, the regression is not very strong. Uh, you must uh, say, you find that uh, the, uh, the chlorophyll in the observation is not very much related to the, the model chlorophyll. So, well, at least uh, you will not have excessive impact from the assimilation because of uh, two outliers in the ensemble. So uh, that's, uh, that's a good way to reduce the impact of outliers. What it does also, the anamorphosis, that's a graphic I've borrowed from Jean-Michel uh, Branca and co authors 2011. Uh, if you're um, not using the anamorphosis, you end up with a shorter covariance structures. So that's an example of, uh, say, uh, nitrate horizontal uh, uh, structures. Uh, to the left is without anamorphosis, to the right with anamorphosis. And um, the correlation ranges are longer once you have transformed the, the, the values to, to Gaussian, which is probably more correct because the, uh, the shorter, the, uh, again, the, the outliers will always tend to make the, the, the scales shorter than they, they, they seem. So um, the, the way to use an amorphosis with a, say, a data simulation system is uh, the same as I said earlier for the, uh, the conditional simulations. All the physical operations are done in the model uh, world. So you perform the forecast to obtain uh, forecast ensemble anomalies here. And all the statistical operations, meaning the application of the Kalman gain and the, the calculation of uh, say, uh, anomalies, the, uh, the uh, comparison to observations, that's all done in the transform space. So that's in the analysis, you are dependent on having uh, the Gaussian assumption. And you do that by in, uh, applying this anamorphosis function. And once you've calculated your analysis in transformed in Gaussian in the Gaussian world, you can back transform every member one by one to the model world and run the model again. And that's uh, yeah, that's the way we are using it now for the uh, the biogeochemical reanalysis in uh, Copernicus. And uh, say uh, I have another point here, but I'm short of time. Um, there's a, a a thing with the uh, the the biogeochemical model that uh, uh, the it is very much dependent on the, the parameters of the model. So you may correct the state of your model, but uh, the model uh, will tend to, uh, to diverge very quickly from it. So here, for example, uh, simulating observations that show that there's very little um, uh, chlorophyll, and the model wants to have a very large bloom straight after. So that's uh, there's a long, uh, very big seesaw in this, in this example here. So uh, one way to do that is to use a, a smoother, and uh, that's uh, something that's being proposed by Moha, uh, and that you will hear later uh, when uh, comes the presentation from uh, Moha and also from uh, Annette Samuelson on Thursday. Yeah, and I have a few references uh, that you can consult in uh, if you click on the link. And I think I'm finished here. So I have a question from the chat here. Um, uh, the Gaussian amorphosis guarantees that once you transform back to the original variables, your results will not be biased, or this can be an issue. Uh, yes, this um, the Gaussian amorphosis guarantees uh, that uh, the, the, there is no bias. In a way, um, if you um, apply a linear operation on, uh, say, a non-Gaussian variable, you may expect a bias. If the... Um, uh, that's because, well, the, um, um, let me take an example. Um, in uh, the, the case of the uh, exponential uh, variables, those that are like this, um, the most likely value is zero. 
But if you take, uh, say, an average, you will uh, have a very strong uh, influence from the very high values. And uh, that is, in short, what is happening uh, with the, uh, say, the application of uh, linear regression to non-Gaussian variables. You have, uh, say, a uh, very high sensitivity to outliers. And if instead you transform this, uh, say, on a log scale, as you do here, um, the estimator uh, is unbiased with uh, with uh, Gaussian variables. So that's that's uh, the, the safest thing we have. And then, uh, once you have your unbiased estimator in the log in the, the Gaussian space, you can transform all of the values back to the the standard uh, uh, values here. And uh, then your mean, your standard deviations, all of these uh, say ensemble statistics will be unbiased. That's um, uh, that's uh, the, the, the one uh, good advantage of doing, doing these uh, ensemble techniques. Um, another one um, from uh, Mr. Turco. Um, could you please advise research papers about comparison of estimation at SSH versus UV, INKF, ensemble array, etc.? I can advise a few of them. Um, let me come to this page here. Um, yeah, it's a bit, a bit impolite, uh, but uh, <clears throat> um, the uh, Lee Setter and uh, Evanson was a comparison of, uh, say, scatter plots of CIS concentrations against temperature salinities. I've, uh, I don't have here uh, the ones uh, from uh, uh, François Cunillon and myself and the Gulf of Mexico. And that's the, uh, the examples we had with this. Uh, uh, these uh, scatter plots here, uh, well, uh, we don't have that many uh, papers. If you just Google Cunillon in 2009, uh, you will find this, uh, this paper here. There's a comparison of different uh, assumption techniques uh, in the Gulf of Mexico in a paper by Ashwant Srinivasan, and that's a 2011 paper as well. Um, uh, please send me an email and I can send you uh, the, uh, the um, the references, or I, know, I will put them in the hack committee in the uh, markdown documents after the, the presentation. So that was uh, the end of these slides. More questions? Thank you, Urko. Um, I'll try to answer on the, on the MD documents. I'm stopping sharing my slides. Um, so now I'm in the uh, HackMD uh, document, and I can share it as well. So um, this, these questions have been answered right before. How do you do when the SMR analysis is not be able to give a Gaussian variable? For example, when there's a Dirac at zero, uh, and that's uh, say, uh, a more general question about the uh, anamorphosis. It's, uh, it is uh, meant to work with, uh, say, monotonous and continuous functions. So it is uh, not going to work well for, you say, a Dirac discontinuities or bimodal distributions, for example, with uh, a long stretch of uh, values without uh, probability. Then the, uh, the anamorphosis, uh, because it is, uh, say, based on a bijective uh, monotonous function will need to smooth things. So, and that will always be a problem if you have a Dirac, strictly Dirac at zero, then you don't want, say, a slightly smooth approximation of the Dirac. It must remain a Dirac because, uh, say, the smoothing will, uh, will be making a mess in your, in your data. And um, so that's the limit of the anamorphosis. It's not uh, good at, uh, say, plurally. Uh, uh, bimodal and uh, non-continuous PDFs. There's other techniques related to that. Uh, there's the um, um, truncated Gaussians, for example, for the Iraqs. Uh, that's something that um, uh, can be dealt with. Um, uh, well, Claire Loverne has a paper about that. Uh, she's one of the participants today. Um, there hasn't been much uh, of uh, progress on that in terms of data simulation. Um, there's the paper by Tiania Janic as well, uh, 
uh, at the, uh, the um, it's uh, starting to be uh, maybe a maybe five or 10 years old paper today, uh, but um, I, can, uh, I can dig it out for you, where the, um, there's linear constraints in, uh, imposed in data simulation in the ensemble camera filter. Uh, so that's, um, it's a combination of data simulation and these uh, say uh, um, optimization under constraints techniques. Um, but other than that, I don't know much of that. There's, um, there's been an approach called the cluster ENKF. Uh, that's been published a, a long time ago, but I haven't seen any follow-up of that. Um, yeah, um, so I'll try to, to list uh, these papers here. How to choose the ensemble size? That's a very good question. I forgot to come to that. Um, so uh, to choose the ensemble size, uh, and there's a little bit of literature on that as well, you need to know uh, the number of uh, degrees of freedom of your system. That is not something that the model will tell you by default, uh, because that comes out of a uh, say complex calculation of uh, uh, Lyapunov exponents. Um, Alberto Carassi's presentation on Friday will come onto this say uh, uh, Lyapunov exponents and the, uh, the dynamical aspects of the, the, the model. But in short, if you are able to calculate the number of uh, Lyapunov exponents, the number of positive and neutral um, Lyapunov exponents, your ensemble size should be larger than that. Then, as well, it should be larger than the number of, the, of uh, not larger, but it should be uh, commensurate, comparable to the number of observations you assimilate. So if you are um, have 100 numbers, but you assimilate thousands of observations uh, in your, say, uh, analysis, then your, um, uh, you will, uh, your update will throw a lot of redundant uh, information from these thousands of observations. So uh, that's as well uh, suboptimal. So it's, um, uh, it's, there's no easy answer to the number of uh, ensemble members. Uh, you need to have an intuition of that based on the, say, the dynamics of a system. You have to reflect on uh, how many, uh, uh, say, how the, the variables can uh, change independent, in independent ways, independent directions, and how many observations will you want to have in your uh, local observation bubble. Um, so, and then it's, uh, there's uh, trial and errors. You need to try, see if uh, you're able to run, or if, uh, if the ensemble size is too small, then you, you end up having all sorts of weird uh, features in your analysis. The, visually, you will notice. Then, uh, is bias linked to no respect of ergodicity? Um, I don't know. Um, Ergodicity is this assumption that what happens here happens everywhere. Uh, it is, uh, say, um, in terms of uh, geostatistics, it means that you, uh, if you integrate uh, the, um, the, the, the probability um, of, uh, of uh, what was it? Um, it's a special integral that, uh, that converges if you inc increase your domain to infinity. Uh, but I've, I've lost the, the details of that. Uh, but um, I, I, I would say that there's no easy connection between bias and uh, ergodicity. There's um, these are say there can be biases coming from all uh, all sorts of uh, say um, problems. Like uh, for example, if your uh, thermometer is not well cal calibrated, then you have a bias in observations. If the model uh, is uh, positioning you the Gulf Stream too far to the south or too far to the north. It's a bias in the um, uh, in the model. So, ergodicity is a very, uh, say, uh, uh, theoretical notion, and uh, bias is something that you can have very pragmatically uh, in your application of data simulation. Uh, but uh, yeah, you can have biases uh, from a lot of causes. Anything that turns wrong will turn into a bias, basically. And that being said, I will try to type uh, the answers here below. That uh, Michael can. <laughs> no, you don't have to uh, to uh, summarize my babbling. And uh, so, if there's no more questions, then I will uh, uh, send you to your.